One of the challenges in staying anonymous, or at least pseudonymous, online is how to pay for services you may need. You may need a paid VPN service, or you may need to pay for a subscription to a video editing service, or an AI image generation service, or maybe an AI text-to-speech service. Obviously, using a credit card or PayPal is not ideal. If you use payment services such as this, there will be a paper trail, somewhere, that can potentially link your real identity to the service you are using, which in turn could be linked to your anonymous online identity. So, as with many situations when it comes to online anonymity, all it takes is a data breach or a rogue employee to effectively dox you. And that's assuming the company holding that data isn't covertly sharing it with an interested party anyway. In the past, one potential way around this was Bitcoin and debit cards paid for in Bitcoin. Even today, many darknet drug markets accept Bitcoin for payment. However, the market share of Bitcoin on these markets is being gradually replaced by Monero. The simple reason for this is that Bitcoin transactions are completely traceable. Every transaction ever conducted on Bitcoin is recorded on the blockchain for anyone and everyone to see. Since the vast majority of people using Bitcoin acquired it from an exchange, like Coinbase, the address of their exchange wallet is forever tied to their real identity. Even wallets that aren't tied to a KYC exchange address can likely be tied to an identity by other means due to companies like Chainalysis. Monero, on the other hand, is not so easily traced. Monero uses several methods to conceal transaction information on the blockchain. It uses something called stealth addresses to effectively encrypt the recipient of transactions. It uses something called ring CT to encrypt the amount of the transactions. And it uses something called ring signatures to obscure the sender of a transaction, mixing the real sender in with numerous decoy transactions. There are other privacy-focused cryptocurrency projects, including some with perhaps even stronger anonymity features. But I think it's safe to say that Monero, especially when used in conjunction with Tor, is effectively untraceable. It's also the largest of such projects with the most adoption, and the deepest bench in terms of talented developers willing to devote their time and effort to not only maintain the project, but also improve the anonymity features with every update. The first step to using Monero is installing a wallet. Since this channel recommends the use of cubes for maximum OPSEC, I will demonstrate how to install Monero in cubes, or at least how I personally install it. There are probably more sophisticated ways to install it, but I personally just install it within a standalone VM with the networking set to SysHunix. So from the cubes manager, create a new cube and name it how you see fit. For the type, select standalone. For the template, select Debian, and for the networking, select SysHunix. Once the cube is created, right-click on it in the Cube Manager, select Settings, then Applications. Find the apps Firefox ESR and Thuner File Manager and move them both from the left column to the right. Then click OK. Next, open Firefox in your new cube and navigate to getmonero.org. Click on the Downloads menu, then find the Monero GUI wallet. Then click on the Linux 64-bit link and download it. Once it finishes downloading, open Thuner File Manager and navigate to the Downloads folder. Then right-click on the archive file and select Extract here. Once it finishes extracting, open the folder and find the Monero Wallet app image file. Right-click on it, select Properties, then Permissions. Make sure the option Allow this file to run as a program is checked. Once confirmed, double-click on the file. You will first be asked if you want to register the program to the desktop. I don't think this works in cubes, so select No. It will then ask you to select your preferred language. You will then be presented with a mode selection screen. I personally use the simple mode. With the simple mode, your wallet will not download the full blockchain, and therefore you will not be running your own node. There are people out there that would recommend you run your own node for maximum security. But I personally do not think this is necessary when your wallet is running through Tor. Most of the tactics used to try and trace Monero transactions rely on IP addresses, 
or if people are swapping back and forth from Monero to other traceable cryptos. If you want to run a full node, make sure you allocate sufficient space to your standalone VM. The current blockchain size is about 250 gigabyte, but you will only need a fraction of that with a pruned node. The next step is to create your wallet. This next screen provides your seed phrase. You should never do what I'm doing here by actually revealing your seed phrase to anyone. Anyone watching this video will be able to access my wallet, but don't bother because it will have a zero balance. Ideally, you should write down the seed phrase on paper and store it somewhere safe. However, if you never intend to keep a large balance, storing it digitally in your vault cube is probably sufficient. This wallet will ensure you wrote down your seed phrase by forcing you to type in a few of the seed words. The wallet will now have you create a password. The level of complexity is up to you. Personally, I don't keep a large balance, and the contents of my laptop is protected by full disk encryption with a very long and complex password. Before you can send payments or see your current balance, the wallet has to fully sync to the current state of the blockchain. Fortunately, you don't have to sync from the very beginning, but there will be some number of days or weeks since the latest wallet release. Over Tor, this can take a while so you may want to let it run in the background or leave your computer running while doing something else. Now that the wallet has fully synced, I will now quickly demonstrate how to send and receive Monero. This is quite straightforward and basically identical to how a Bitcoin wallet works. First, I'm going to send myself a small amount from one of my personal wallets. The main receive address is this address, which always starts with four. However, I would always recommend generating a new sub address, which always starts with an eight, for each new transaction. This way, no exchange can correlate your behavior by identifying the same address you're receiving to. Obviously, you would also want to avoid accepting Monero payments to an address you use with your real identity and also use with your anonymous content identity. Before I can spend it, the wallet, or perhaps the Monero protocol itself, I'm not actually sure, requires 10 confirmations. The block time in Monero is 2 minutes, compared to 10 minutes in Bitcoin. So this takes about 20 minutes. Rather than sending this small amount back to one of my own wallets, I'm thinking a better idea is to donate it. The Cube's project itself actually accepts Monero for donations, and I can think of no better place to donate considering what I cover on this channel. If you use Cubes, I would recommend donating. The Tor project, Hunix project, and Graphene OS, just to name a few, also accept Monero for payment. So basically anything worth actually using. I can't send the full balance, since each transaction requires a small fee. If you want to send the entire balance of your wallet, click the infinity icon as I am doing here. Now that you know how to install and use the Monero wallet, the next step is actually acquiring some. There are a few KYC exchanges that support Monero, at least in the United States. Kraken is the most popular. You can find a full list at getmonero.org. If you use an exchange such as Kraken, make sure to move your coins off the exchange to your own wallet before spending it. A more common way to acquire Monero is to use a swapping service, such as changenow.io. You get Bitcoin, or some other mainstream cryptocurrency from an exchange like Coinbase, then swap it for Monero. One thing to keep in mind, if you're using the typical cube setup that I recommend, most of these swapping services will not allow you to transact over Tor. Most will work with a VPN though, so you'll need to use a VPN after Tor setup to get them to work. For instructions on how to accomplish this, see my last video. Change Now also has an option to purchase with a credit card which may not be a bad option if you do not have a Coinbase or Kraken account. This may seem like a risky suggestion, but when acquiring Monero, maximum OPSEC is not truly necessary, since after you acquire that Monero and move it to your own wallet, nobody can trace where it's going subsequently. However, I would still recommend moving your Monero to a wallet that only connects through Tor, 
such as the setup I demonstrated in Cubes, before spending it on any services related to your anonymous content. When using either an exchange or a credit card, some financial institution will know you own Monero. I don't see this as a huge problem since most cryptocurrency is used for speculation. In the unlikely scenario that someone ever questions you about owning Monero, you can simply claim that you believe privacy-focused coins will appreciate in value, and you're trying to capitalize on that. However, if you're still concerned about anyone even knowing you own Monero, there are a few options, but they require much more effort. One option is to mine Monero. Monero uses a mining algorithm that prevents ASICs and graphics cards from being very efficient, and thus the most effective way to mine is with a CPU. However, the payoff from mining is quite low. A typical modern PC may be able to make 5 to 10 US dollars in mining rewards per month. If all you need is a VPN subscription, this may be adequate. If mining doesn't cover your needs, another option is using a P2P exchange that supports cash through the mail. There used to be a great service called Local Monero that facilitated a large cash through the mail market for Monero. With Local Monero gone, there's only a few remaining options with a much smaller user base. The primary two options now are BISC and Haveno. I haven't used either of these yet. My understanding is that BISC has a steep learning curve at first, and they don't do much volume in Monero anyway. If I'm off base in this assessment, please let me know in the comments. Haveno will likely be the replacement for local Monero, but the main official instance of Haveno has not launched yet. There are some unofficial instances of Haveno popping up, the most prominent of which is Haveno Reto. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It already has some cash through the mail trades occurring, so it looks promising so far. A final option I will mention is Atomic Swaps. Atomic Swaps are a kind of P2P, or peer-to-peer, -peer, transaction that is mediated using a cryptographic protocol. The details are a bit beyond my level of understanding, but if an Atomic Swap is implemented correctly, the process is completely trustless. Once a transaction has begun, it either completes or your funds are returned if it fails for some reason. I view atomic swaps as a kind of happy medium between using an exchange and using cash through the mail. If you're swapping KYC Bitcoin from an exchange, some external observer could perhaps make an educated guess that you're swapping for Monero, but they wouldn't know for sure. They just see that your Bitcoin is going to some address, and perhaps they could tell that the address is being used for Monero atomic swaps. On the other hand, some exchange like ChangeNow would certainly have a record that these particular Bitcoin, which can be tied to you through the KYC exchange, were exchanged for Monero, and that record could be hacked, leaked, or subject to a government subpoena. There are a few different Monero atomic swap platforms I've heard of, but the only one I've used is at unstoppableswap.net. I cannot currently recommend these atomic swaps, since their app image application does not work with current versions of Debian or Fedora that come with the latest Cubes release. Another reason is that the minimum swap amount with a reasonable exchange rate is nearly $100 due to the current price of Bitcoin. But I would still keep an eye on the service and revisit in case the Cubes compatibility changes or if the minimum swap limits come down. As with any swap service, whether an instant exchange or atomic swaps, I would recommend swapping small amounts at a time in case something goes wrong. Once you've acquired some Monero and have it in your wallet and cubes connected through Tor, you're ready to spend it. A number of services accept Monero directly, including VPN providers such as iVPN and Mulvad. Some services accept Bitcoin and other crypto, but do not accept Monero. In cases like this, I would recommend creating a single-use burner Bitcoin wallet. Use a swapping service like ChangeNow, connected through VPN after Tor. Swap Monero into Bitcoin, pay for the service in Bitcoin, then never use that wallet again. If you need to pay for a service that only accepts credit cards, there's a few options available, fortunately. One method I've used a few times now is CakePay. CakePay is a related service to the very popular Monero wallet, Cake Wallet. The CakePay interface is quite easy and straightforward. The only issue I've encountered is actually activating the card. CakePay itself is very privacy friendly but the company they work with to activate the card is not quite so friendly. If you are connected through Tor or a normal VPN, the activation will fail. There are two ways around this. One is to use a VPN with a dedicated IP address. The company probably has a blacklist of known VPN IP addresses, so it does not recognize the dedicated IP VPN of actually being a VPN. I managed to do this recently in cubes using OpenVPN, but it was quite involved. 
I may do a video on this in the future. Another option I would only grudgingly recommend is to activate it without a VPN. I would only do this over public Wi-Fi somewhere a few towns over from where you live, at minimum. Another privacy hurdle you will encounter is that the activation will require a name, address, and phone number. For this, just use an alias name and a random address generator. For the phone number, I use a burner phone where the phone itself and prepaid plan are purchased with cash. The phone is only powered on away from home for account verification. The rest of the time it sits powered off in a Faraday bag. When activating the phone, I made sure to use an area code somewhere far away from the state I actually live in that matches the fake address I generated. I will cover this when I resume my How to Not Get Doxxed series. I have not actually tried using a fake phone number when trying to activate the card. That may work, but I always err on the side of providing a phone number I have control of, in case there's some phone verification step. Also note that for basically any service that asks for your phone number, a voice over IP number, such as Google Voice, will never be accepted. If you do not have a burner phone yet, an easier option might be to buy a physical prepaid gift card from Amazon using a non-shop. A non-shop acts as a middleman between you and Amazon. You put together a list of items you want to buy, pay in Monero, then a non-shop ships it to an Amazon locker of your choice. A non-shop requires zero personal information aside from what Amazon locker they're shipping to. These lockers are typically located in various retail stores. The only potential thing that could compromise your privacy are CCT cameras of the store or on the Amazon locker itself. If this is a concern, you can always wear sunglasses and a COVID mask without raising too much suspicion, at least for now. One complication to using prepaid gift cards is that they aren't available in all states. So if you want to use an Amazon locker in Hawaii, Kansas, New Mexico, South Dakota, U.S. Virgin Islands, Vermont, or West Virginia, this will not work. That is, unless you live close to a state line and are willing to drive to a nearby state. As with anything else, I would suggest testing this with a low-value gift card in case you hit any snags. I bought one of these last year and I do not recall needing to activate it. I was able to use it online and in retail stores like a normal debit card. But the requirements of MasterCard or Visa could have changed between then and now. Hopefully, between one of those two options, you can anonymously use any services you may need. If you found any of this information useful and want to support me, I've left a Monero donation address in the description. I will never willingly allow any platform I'm on to run ads, and I will never take any sponsors. I will also never use anything like Patreon, so Monero is the only way to support me. Thanks for watching.